Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this, um, this important and interesting event. Um, I have been a, a regulatory economist for some years and uh, have been involved in um, incentive regulation, uh, both as a, a spectator and as a commentator, and to a limited extent as a practitioner. Um, going back to the 20 or 30 years, I was involved in setting price controls in the telecommunications sector um, in the UK, uh, and recently I've been involved in um, setting price controls um, in, the, in the energy sector in, in part of the United Kingdom. Um, and what I'd like to do, if I may, since I'm not a, a railway specialist, um, is, to, is to give what I might describe as a rather personal overview um, of the issue of, um, of price caps, incentive regulation, and so on. Uh, and I've titled my talk, Incentive Regulation in Theory, Price Caps in Practice, but that title really comes from a, a quotation of which I'm rather fond. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Now, there's, there's a certain dispute about the, the provenance of this saying with two rather surprisingly different candidates to be the person who actually said it. Um, the first is Einstein. The second is a, a US baseball player called Yogi Berra. Now, Mr. Berra is famous for various pithy remarks. The one which I particularly like is the following. If you come to a fork in the road, take it, which is very good advice, which I sometimes press upon the people whom I'm advising when they seem to be dithering too much. So there are those two rather different, um, um, rather different candidates for this. Uh, to my mind, it's, it's too simple for Einstein and not pithy enough for Mr. Berra. So I think there's probably some third person who, who actually said it. But it provides a, a convenient peg for me to, to, to hang um, a, a discussion uh, in particular about the contribution which economic analysis has made to the development of incentive regulation uh, and the degree to which it has in fact largely been shaped by administrative practice. Beginning with some general observations about incentives, um, in my early days as an academic, um, there still existed the Soviet Union and Soviet-type economies, um, and those did form the subject of my early academic work. And it was impressed upon all of us who were involved in that activity how readily organizations of all kinds responded to incentives. Let me give you an example. This, this magnificent building is equipped with numerous chandeliers. Now, if, if anybody visited the Soviet Union, where they had um, a taste for these, these rather retro czarist decorations, it was considered dangerous to stand underneath a chandelier. Now, why was that? It was because the plan for the manufacturers of chandeliers was denominated in tons. They just had to produce so many tons of chandeliers. And so in consequence, they tend to make them very large and very heavy. And in consequence, standing under them was potentially quite a dangerous thing to do. If anybody's similarly positioned here, you might want to move your chairs. Um, although I rather doubt that 19th century France, France was subject to quite the same incentive system. Perhaps more pertinently for this gathering, I became very interested in the degree to which you could improve the planning process by computerization. An obvious thing you could do in principle was to solve a mathematical program which attached customers to suppliers. So it's so many factories, so many demand points, solve a program to minimize transport costs. And so they did that, very simple program. But it was completely fruitless because the transport organizations had their plans, to which their bonuses were tied, denominated in ton kilometers. So their interest was in loading a train, sending it to the other end of the Soviet Union, which was 4,000 kilometers away, because that was the cheapest and easiest method of fulfilling the plan. Now, unfortunately, 
one encounters the same response to incentives in the bits of the public sector which I have observed. I spent many years working in universities and still do to some extent. And about 20 years ago, driven by rather crude application of some theories in what's called the new public management, which involved the setting of targets, the government of the UK decided that it would introduce um, quality-based assessments of research activity within universities, but it didn't apply similar quality assessments to the teaching side of the business. So what happened? All the resources of the universities were devoted to research. The students who just had to be counted and whose enjoyment or understanding of the course wasn't taken into account were completely neglected. These are two interesting examples in which organizations which you might think might have a propensity to have some broader interest in mind, if you believe, for example, that the Soviet Union was a, a center for what's rather optimistic called really existing socialism, and the public sector is full of altruistic people. But they didn't. They responded. So it's hardly surprising that in the case of particularly investor-owned utilities, you're going to get the same type of incentive problems. So within the traditional study of regulation, there's been a lot of focus based upon the use in the United States for the past 100 years or so of so-called cost of rate of return regulation, which basically was a, a, a form of cost plus. The company was allowed to recover in its charges what it expended on producing the, the energy or the telecommunications or whatever it was. It's hardly surprising that in those circumstances they responded, as one would expect, by paying minimal attention to, to cost cutting. And when that was combined with um, a situation in which the return which they were allowed on capital exceeded the cost of capital, then had an additional incentive to use very, very heavily capital-intensive technologies. And as a consequence, not only was production inefficient, but it was actually distorted in terms of the way in which it was done. So but the common problem here is that end users, that's us who buy these things, lack effective power to control the costs and to determine the characteristic of, what, of what's produced. And so the problem with incentives, correspondingly, is how we can introduce a set of incentives which, to the greatest possible degree, aligns producers' incentives with end users' desires for particular goods and services which are produced. So that, in a way, is the problem. Now, the difficulty that immediately arises, if you're trying to do this by regulatory fiat, rather than relying upon the forces of competition to drive people into keeping their costs down and giving the customers what they want, is the lack of information that regulators have about the efficient costs of production. They probably know that inherited or legacy cost levels are inflated, but they don't know how much. So the question that they have is, can they devise an incentive system? This is a narrower question than my first question, the, the previous slide. Can they devise an incentive system which encourages the firm to produce more efficiently and ideally to disclose its potential for such performance? The reason for that second bit is something which I will come on to shortly in a brief discussion of menu regulation. In, in the United Kingdom, we started down this road when we started privatizing our utilities um, in the 1980s. And a very influential proposal was made by Stephen Littlechild um, to the then government at the time of telecoms privatization as to how one might actually solve the second question, which was how do you incentivize efficient production? Now, he was operating within a rather narrow framework, which has since proved to be pretty unrealistic. Because he thought that after the initial period of price control that was introduced from 1984 to 1989, there would be sufficient competition in the market for no further price control to be necessary. <clears throat> as far as he was concerned, if you set prices exogenously for the first five years, then after that period was up, prices would continue to be set exogenously, 
but then by the forces of competition. So he was really just focusing upon a single period case. And what he proposed um, was a, um, a, a system whereby you would just prescribe a trajectory of prices in real terms for the five years, and that would therefore give the company an incentive to reduce costs, because to the extent that it reduced its costs at the margin, those would go straight into the newly created shareholders' pockets. So it appeared to be a quite attractive incentive regime. And what it was particularly good at doing is basically to get rid of that legacy of inefficient production. It wasn't a question of prices being wrong at the margin or anything like that. It was a concern. There was massive excess costs, excess costs in the system. Now, because that was the concern, the cost calculations which were fed into the construction of the price directory going into the future were really extremely rudimentary. And in a sense, it didn't matter except in the short term because provided you achieve the effect of increasing productive efficiency, provided you achieved that effect, um, then the main benefit would be gauged. And it's fair to say that some countries, the United States in particular, I would guess, still don't focus a great deal upon producing a trajectory of prices which is based upon an exact computation of efficient costs. Because as far as they're concerned, the main benefit is just simply the exogeneity of the prices rather than the particular level they get. Because exogeneity is enough, setting them in advance for five years, to generate the incentives for efficiency. Now, what do we do now um, in terms of getting costs and, and where do they come from? We do it, as I've recently discovered in the course of my price control on energy, through an immensely detailed tabulation of costs. We also try to make use of comparative competition or benchmarking, looking at the costs of the organization which you're studying compared with other similar organizations. But that's quite tricky because organizations may be similar, but they're still significantly different if they're operating in a different geographic or economic environment. And so the benchmarking can't simply be read across. And there are also quite grave concerns about the efficiency of the benchmarks. If you're benchmarking 10 energy companies, and they're all pretty inefficient, you aren't going to get a very good sense of what would amount to an efficient energy company. But you might live in a kind of fool's paradise, believing that they are efficient because they're inefficient to the same degree. Okay? And I would suggest that once, in some sense, you've, you've actually eliminated the worst inefficiency, um, then it becomes more important to try and, try and hunker down and get these cost things right. Benchmarking is quite a good way of doing it, but it's perhaps not the only way. Now, let me now introduce one of the, um, the key economic ideas which, um, uh, which were developed um, in France by Lafont and Tyrol, those two brilliant... Um, uh, uh, economists um, at, uh, at Toulouse University, one of them sadly no longer with us. They proposed a, a system which would enable you just simply through economic reasoning and appeal to incentives to be able to, to focus upon a more realistic target which could be embedded in the trajectory of prices which you create into the future. And they did this by suggesting that if you don't know whether the firm that you're investigating is an efficient firm or an inefficient firm, you can get that firm to disclose its level of efficiency by offering a choice of contracts. And the choice of contracts in the simplest implementation would be the following. You can just simply have your costs, okay? Make no profits. If you're inefficient, that's what you'll choose. Alternatively, if you know you're efficient, you can set yourself a target which might actually be tougher than would be associated just with um, the costs that you would incur with no incentive at all. And the deal would be that if you set yourself a tough enough target, 
and you met that target, you would be allowed to keep some of the surplus. So you're offering people a choice of either making no profits if you're inefficient, but if you're efficient, you can take on a more attractive and arduous target. And if you overfulfill or overfill that, you will then be able to, um, to gain some, some significant profits. So you can see what the regulator is trying to do by this means is to, is to buy some information from the firm in question by offering a deal, you show me what you can do and I'll reward you by allowing you some profits. If you're unwilling to accept that deal, then you'll be based in a, in a zero profit equilibrium. Now we've tried to do that a bit in the United Kingdom and I think you'll probably be hearing about this in slightly more detail um, later on in this, um, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this day since there are a number of people with much more experience of UK regulation in this respect than I have. I think it's probably fair to say it's been ingenious, um, as befits um, its progenitors, um, La Font and Tyrol. Um, it, it's been used in the energy sector and in the water sector. It may be considered for use in other, in other sectors in the future. It's been implemented in a manner which seems to me to be fairly cautious because the rewards for accepting a higher target and then fulfilling or overfilling that have been quite small. Um, but nonetheless, it's been a useful tool in, in the armory of, um, of regulators because it does offer a theoretically int interesting and practically implementable approach for overcoming the, the asymmetric information problem, which I have referred to and really lies at the core of the problem of incentivizing utilities to behave efficiently. Now, and I want to run very quickly through a number of issues which, which have arisen. And one of them is something which I, I became aware of as having become prevalent in the rather, over the rather long period in which I wasn't personally involved in setting price controls. And that's the business of, of sharing under or over performance. The version of price caps that I set out was one in which you just simply set a trajectory of prices, and then you don't touch it for five years. That's the deal. Okay? But increasingly in UK regulation, there's been a tendency to allow some kind of adjustment of prices or revenues within the period in question. So if a firm does particularly well and makes, say, an additional 100 million pounds, it might have to give 50 million pounds of that back to customers the next year in terms of lower prices. Now, what's all that about? Why do we want to move to a system which weakens the incentive basis of price cap regulation? And to be honest, I'm not quite sure why this comes about. I think it's, it's partly due to a feeling many regulators are still quite seriously afflicted by the asymmetric information problem. That's to say, there's a lot of scope for regulated firms to extract rents from that situation, the information which they haven't yet disclosed. Um, and in consequence of this, the regulators are concerned that if they just let the highly powered incentive system operate, very high profits will be made and the regulator will look bad. Now, I guess that probably isn't a particularly compelling reason because all it means is that the process of acquiring the information, which you've got to do anyway, is spread over two periods of price controls rather than over a single period. And there's also a particular concern about disreputable non-investments. That's a situation in which a regulated firm incorporates a big investment project in its, in its plans and that is accepted as part of the cost base by the regulator but then magically it turns out when the regulatory period is running out that the investment is not required. Okay? And that leaves the regulator asking itself, well, were they tricking me into believing this project was necessary? 
or did the existence of the incentives that I've set up encourage them to think of a very clever way which would make the investment not necessary and save rail users or power users hundreds of millions of pounds? And because the regulator can't really answer the question of which of those alternatives is likely to be the case, the regulator's tempted to say, okay, well, in that case, we'll split the difference. Now, I've been talking mostly or implicitly about a regime in which all costs were subject to incentive regulation. But in many regulatory systems, and this applies not only in the United Kingdom, but I suspect in France too, there tends to be a dual track approach to incentives. And it takes the following form. Operating expenditure, which tends to be pretty constant from year to year, and it can reasonably be projected as falling because there's likely to be overemployment in the sector, operating expenditure is subject to incentive regulation. That's to say the regulator sets an amount that you can recover for operating expenditure for the four or five years. But capital investment, because it's idiosyncratic and may be quite volatile, operates as what's sometimes called a pass-through. That means it's cost plus. If you make the investment, you earn the return on it. So you have this dual track system with OPEX being incentivized and CAPEX being a pass-through. Now, the inevitable situation, consequences of that situation, is that firms are very keen on substituting capital for labor because the CAPEX is a pass-through, but the labor is not a pass-through. And so you get added into other effects which tend to distort production decisions you get this additional important effect coming in, which creates a very strong capex bias. And this is partly due to the fact that many regulators are inclined to think that investment is ipso facto a good thing. But of course, investment is an input. Inputs are not good things. Outputs are good things. And the trick is to find ways of reducing those outputs at the lowest possible cost for end users. And so a focus upon investment, which is very prominent, for example, now in the telecom sector because of the obsession within Europe for building fiber networks. So regulators boast, so to speak, I have allowed X, X million euros in my regulatory price control for the installation of fiber. But obviously the question is, is that really in the interest of end users or is it going to have some kind of distortionary effect? Now, let's go back to the question of how long the cap should last and what do you do when it ends. The, the little child world, 1983 in the UK, didn't acknowledge this problem because Professor Littlechild thought that the, the cavalry would rush in in the form of competition to make further regulation unnecessary. Okay? But that didn't happen in telecoms and it sure as anything isn't going to happen in high voltage transmission um, or in railway infrastructures. So it then becomes key what you do at the time when the cap is expiring and you have to consider what you do next. And experience teaches that this causes various dysfunctional consequences. The first is that because firms don't know what their investment allowance is going to be for the following few years, they may just stop investing. And that's obviously very inefficient if you've got a five-year price control to have three years in the middle of investment and then two years of nothing happening while people are adjusting to the new price control period. Okay. There's also the problem that as you get towards the end of the period, and here I'm going to use the productivity word, which was, was used a few moments ago by, um, um, by the RF president. As you get towards the end of the period, there is very little incentive to increase productivity because the regulator will observe it. And when the regulator is creating the next price control period, 
it will take it into account. So you tend to get productivity gains focused towards the beginning of the price control period once people have figured out how to game the system. Now, there are ways of dealing with this, which have been applied in the UK, but the problem is they all add to complexity, which is a concept which I want to finish up with in a very few minutes. Now, how do you maintain commitment across the price control period? Okay. The system that's grown up in the UK is to establish a regulatory asset base and the assumption is that if an asset is included in the regulatory asset base, the company will continue to be allowed to receive depreciation on that value and also to earn a rate of return on that value. Okay? Now, a similar concept um, is, is used in, in, um, in French, um, although for some reason you call it base d'actif régulé rather than the regulatory asset base, but um, we'll, we'll pass over that, um, that very small um, uh, linguistic uh, distinction. It doesn't really matter how the regulatory asset base is derived in a historical sense. It can be based on all sorts of weird and wonderful valuations, and that's certainly true for UK utilities. But the point is that going forward, it's seen as a kind of commitment. It will stop the regulator or impede the regulator if it wants effectively to expropriate assets. That doesn't totally preclude revaluations, and those have been tried in some sectors, but they are fairly, they are fairly um, disruptive. They have been applied, for example, in relation to British telecommunications assets, regulatory asset base, and also to France Telecom's regulatory asset base. In both the price controls which I've been involved with recently, there has been a certain amount of discussion about making adjustments retrospectively to the regulatory asset base, um, but in the end, no such adjustments were made. And I think this is a, a very important instrument for creating the kind of degree of certainty about investment which is necessary when we're asking people to commit to investment which may last 30 or 40 years. Now, most of the price controls that were introduced in the UK were introduced at the time when the company in question was being privatized. So most of our experience has been dealing with investor-owned utilities which are subject to price caps. But we do have an important exception, which is the Royal Mail, the, the, the postal delivery service, which remained in public ownership entirely until 2013. And the UK government decided in about 2000 that it would be subject to independent regulation and that would be based upon a price cap system. But what actually happened was rather different in that case from what happened with the investor-owned utilities. In essence, the problem was that the shareholder was not able, for various reasons, to impose the same kind of discipline upon the management of the company in favor of cost reduction, as had proved to be the case in most of the investor-owned utilities. In essence, the price caps weren't met, the company fell into loss, and the government bailed it out. And this was obviously not an entirely satisfactory long-term state of affairs from anybody's point of view. Now, this was a very strong case because there was no private shareholding. But, but clearly, um, there, are, there are some circumstances in which you have to consider um, what's going to happen. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff and conclude by, um, first of all, by talking about the evidence on how price caps work. What, what can economists tell us about whether they're successful in keeping prices down, improving quality, and things of that kind? Well, we have the advantage that in the, the 50 states in the United States of America, local state regulators have imposed different forms of price control within the same industry. 
So we can compare the results and see what's happened. We can compare the cost plus regulation with the price cap regulation and see which turns out to be the best. Okay? Now, this is a slightly downbeat summary by David Sappington 10 years ago of what the early evidence suggested. Okay? I have done some work myself on the impact of price controls in the UK water industry, and that suggested, too, that the results were not spectacular. There was a massive reduction in OPEX, but that was accompanied by a huge increase in CAPEX and in capital inputs. So if you looked at total factor productivity, in only one of the four price control periods did that change, and that turned out to be the period in which the regulator, by common consent, had imposed a particularly testing target. Now, this is consistent with the idea that regulated firms, when they know that this year's four-year price cap period is going to be followed by next year's four-year price cap period, they will keep some stuff in reserve so that their, their jobs as managers will be easier in the following period. So I'm not suggesting the evidence suggests that price caps are a panacea, um, but the question, as we'll see in a moment, is alternative. Uh, what are the alternatives? If I could just say something briefly about French experience, which um, I, I am not familiar with, um, but, but I have with a, with a colleague at the Competition and Markets Authority um, where I work, um, who, has, um, who has worked for various French regulators, I, I've reviewed some of the material with great interest and, uh, and admiration. It seems to me that the caps which I've examined in energy and rail seem to be not dissimilar from the ones which have been applied in the United Kingdom, but the costing seemed to be much less complex. Instead of producing, um, as we did recently, in setting a price cap for Northern Ireland, a very small part of the United Kingdom, about three million people, we produced a price control which was 600 pages, and which, I, personally, I believe is far too long. Um, the, the price control documents which I've seen emerging from French regulatory authorities uh, are admirably brief and concise. And I think that's probably a matter for congratulation as much as for anything else. But I did get the impression, I may be wrong in this, that the, the structure of the process was rather different since the regular T would come up with a proposal which the regulator would comment on as distinct from the UK experience where the regulator gathers in using its information gathering powers all the information that it thinks it needs and then makes a decision itself, it has what I might describe as first mover advantages. And so the tone of the discussion and the consultation is basically set by something which emanates from the regulator's office. I have a suspicion, which is certainly no more than that, um, that that may produce, the two alternatives may produce a rather different sort of structure and process uh, which may actually affect the substance of them. So let me now come on to the end the theory and practice. Uh, has the economics profession shaped incentive-based price control in utilities? I think to some extent that's true. And, and I do admire hugely the, the contributions which have been made by La Font and Tyrol. I understand that Professor Tyrol gave a speech at your last year's um, conference. And I have a huge admiration for, um, uh, for him. Um, La Font and Tyrol and, and another duo um, Armstrong and Sappington, who produced a, a very extensive summary of the, of the theory of incentive regulation um, in, a, in a book called The Handbook of Industrial Organization, Volume 3. They have come up with some very good ideas which have had quite considerable effects. But it also seems to me that, that quite a lot of the stuff that regulators do is not really derived sort of linearly from the thoughts of economists it really emerges from administrative practice that's probably been around for ages. For example, my Soviet economists, whom, with whom I was acquainted in the 1970s, const constructed in an entirely atheoretical way an incentive regime which had some of the information revelation properties, 
which were subsequently adumbrated in much more detail and much more elegantly by La Fonte and Tyrol. I've suggested here that we can find parallels in ancient Egypt. Now, I did, in fact, made that up. I'm not confident that there are parallels in ancient Egypt, but I wouldn't be at all surprised um, if the building of the pyramids was accompanied by some form of incentive regulation. I mean, possibly the incentive was, if you don't get this stone up there in three minutes, you'll be dead, uh, which is something which I would not recommend present-day regulators to, uh, to seek to put into effect. But I think quite a lot of these things emerge through a kind of administrative, I nearly said administrative science, but that's probably the wrong word, through an administrative process rather than, rather than an economic process. And I think there tends to be a kind of, a kind of um, cycle in regulation. You start off with something simple, like Professor Littlechild's ideas in 1983. It turns out it can be gamed. You respond to the gaming by introducing a whole lot of additional considerations and ramifications and complications. That elicits more gaming. You respond to that gaming by more elaborations. Eventually, it gets too complicated. Nobody has a clue how it works. Everybody's fed up with it. And so they say, let's get rid of all this stuff. Go back to basics. So they go back to basics. And then what happens? Same thing again. The new basics, it turns out, can be gamed in various ways. People responding, for example, to a difference in the, in the, uh, the, the plan for the production of chandeliers, if they switch from, from weight to volume, they just produce very, very big chandeliers instead of very heavy chandeliers. And so you, you, you end up with a, a kind of irreducible problem that outside a market context, it's very difficult to do what you're trying to do via an incentive regulations. There are some ideas which are kicking around in the UK as to how this might be done. One is to return to a focus on incentivizing outputs. Get away from looking at costs. Just focus upon outputs. This seems to me to be the, the kind of behavior which I described in reverting to phase one, back to basics, back to simplicity. Another way is a method which involves basically sidestepping the problem by the regulator saying, okay, end users and regulated company, you go and sort out a plan. If you can't agree, I'll do it. But otherwise, I'm happy to delegate the negotiations to a group of end users. Now, if that worked, it'd be quite interesting. Incidentally, it creates an incentive if the regulator wants the two parties to agree it creates an incentive for the regulator to behave so monstrously that rather than leave it to the regulator, they'll agree on anything because it's going to be better for themselves, which probably is a slightly dysfunctional incentive. So where does that leave me? It leaves me with a feeling that economists have made quite a big contribution. As to the substance of price controls and incentive regulation, I would suggest that the following is the case. You recall the remark made by Winston Churchill about democracy. He said it was the worst form of government there is apart from all the others. And I think I would be inclined to say something a bit similar about price caps. It's not a great form of controlling prices. It's a lot of hard work. But if you think what the alternatives are, then it looks quite good. So thank you very much. Mr. Gave, thank you very much for your outstanding presentation. De cette riche présentation, je retiens la euh, minimal l'importance du sujet de l'asymétrie d'information entre les régulés et le régulateur. Et j'espère bien que le, dans la suite de cette journée, on, on pourra trouver des clés justement pour adresser ce genre de, de problématiques très intéressantes pour le mode de régulation incitatif. Y a-t-il des questions dans la salle Alors, moi, j'ai plein de questions, donc du coup, je vais en profiter. Euh, Monsieur Kev, pour un mode de régulation incitative, euh, quels sont les outils, les moyens ou les prérequis nécessaires à asseoir la crédibilité du régulateur 
Well, um, I, I think that regulators might usefully conceive of themselves as, as being a, a kind of organized representative of end users. Um, but a representative of end users, which is not interested in the short term, but in the long term. In, in Australian regulation, the duty that is imposed upon the regulator is to act in the long-term interest of end users. And I think that's very good. And what does that entail? It means that you should get costs down to the maximum possible extent, that the companies should be subject to efficiency constraints. If they fail to operate efficiently, um, then there should be bad consequences for them. But at the same time, it's important to maintain the continuity of supply and changes in the quality of the service that are being offered, and that requires investment. So I think if a, if a regulator can position itself in the public mind as somebody who is basically on the side of end users, but doing so in a way which requires the, the cooperation and assistance of the, of the regulated company, and with a focus upon the long term and upon investments, that I think is, is, a, is a way in which um, a popular enthusiasm, although that might be too strong a word, um, popular a tolerance of regulators uh, might be sustainable. So that's the kind of concept that I have as to, as to how regulators work, that in a sense the, um, the, uh, the regulator is acting for the end users um, and the firm is acting for the capital markets and some way has to be found giving primacy to the interests of end users, but recognizing the constraints that are imposed upon the regime by the necessity to continue to get investment going into the system. D'autres questions dans la salle? Oui, Monsieur Smith. Uh, I'm Andrew Smith, Institute for Transport Studies, University of Leeds. Uh, it's j just a comment, really, on, on your last point there um, about uh, you know, negotiation between end, use, end users and the firms. Um, I think one of the dangers in this whole area is, you know, in a sense, there's nothing new under the sun in regulation. And uh, you know, the whole point of regulation is you've got natural monopolies, and therefore end users can't, to my mind, sensibly negotiate with a natural monopoly. Uh, so I, just, I don't know if you might want to elaborate a little bit on that last point in that, I mean, to me, getting end users involved is very important, but at the end of the day, it's a job of economic regulation to, to deal with, in my view. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that the, 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 the kind of involvement of end users have in mind isn't the exercise of their power as purchasers, um, because obviously if they're, if they're numerous and they're facing a natural monopoly, um, they're going to be, come out very badly from that particular negotiation. The, the whole thing really hinges upon the final phrase that I've used there, that these negotiations are taking place in the shadow of the regulator. That basically, the regulator is there in the background to pick up the pieces if the negotiation fails. And so what the negotiating parties are taking to account is the, the counterfactual of the regulator coming in and doing it Okay? rather than the counterfactual of the monopolist just simply using its economic power to take advantage of customers. So if that can be done, and if, and it's a quite big if, and I hasten to say I, I don't particularly support this kind of um, process, except in rather special circumstances, um, if it's going to be done, it must rely upon the notion that in some sense the end users brigaded in some kind of committees or something, can better express their wishes than they can via the intermediary of the regulator. Okay? So I think, I think there has to be some kind of, for that test to work, there has to be um, some, some kind of um, special way in which, um, in which the negotiation can take place, which enables you to find a, a solution which is better compared with the regulator's solution, which is better both for the firm and for the end users. But I do see it as, as involving very substantial problems, especially in circumstances where the end users are households rather than very large firms. 
very brief comments on that. Actually, that there is a, um, a case recently where this has been tried. The water industry economic regulator in Scotland uh, tried exactly this approach, effectively uh, delegating to a panel of uh, users, households and business, um, the process of determining what outputs they wanted and you know, effectively negotiating with the company on price. Uh, too soon to say what effect that's had, but that's exactly the kind of experiment that I think we're all looking at very closely. Uh, yes, hello, Jean-Christophe Thibault from ARAF. Uh, as you pointed out in the presentation, uh, the objective, uh, well, the motivation for more efficiency is a possibility of profit. But when it is a publicly owned firm, one can argue that it is not profit oriented. It more has a soft budget constraint, I'd say. And so in this case, do we have to adapt the whole uh, scheme uh, in order to incentivize the, a publicly owned firm? Um, I, I, I suggested that the, the effect of price controls is going to be different in the context of publicly owned firms. Um, but, but, but in a way, that sort of um, begs the question as to whether it should affect the regulator's conduct. Um, I, I could see quite good grounds for suggesting that the regulator should, in such, such a context, should, should try and identify um, the efficient way of producing the outputs and should allow the prices charged <coughs> to recover those efficiently incurred costs. Okay. So in other words, in setting the price control, it doesn't seem to me to be unreasonable that the price control should be based upon the regulator's calculations done in, in broadly the same manner as would be done if the enterprise were in private ownership rather than in public ownership. Um, now, that doesn't mean that in either case, public ownership or private ownership, that the regulator should invariably assume that every single bit of inefficiency in the business is going to be eliminated in the four years of the price control. I mean, in both cases, we're talking about inevitably a kind of glide path where costs come down over a period of, say, two or possibly three successive price controls towards some efficient level. You know, one, one can't impose upon a firm a speed of adjustment, which is beyond anything that's, that's practicable. Okay? Now, if, if the policy which I described were put into effect, um, it would then have consequences for the financials whatever the ownership structure is, of the firm in question. And, and those consequences, <coughs> in the case of the Royal Mail, had to be faced by the beneficial owner, which was the government. Um, and it's a bit hard to be entirely clear about the nature of cause and effect here, um, but once um, the British economy had got into the the doldrums associated with the global financial crisis and the, the huge deficit financing with which it was faced, um, then the government became rather less tolerant of that kind of arrangement than it had been in the past. It depends, of course, like everything else, upon the statutory basis of regulation. But in a, a kind of a UK context where the, the statutory basis is um, broadly, as I've indicated, that's to say, it is to have concerns, and I'm not speaking legally here, but, but in practice, to have concerns primarily for end users, but at the same time recognizing the importance of the constraints of getting investment into the business. If you're operating under that kind of framework, then the policy which I've described may make sense, but I wouldn't necessarily say it would work in every context and subject to every set of legislation. <laughs> 